Einen wunderschönen guten Abend. Good evening. Did you see in the lobby the 3D printers printing marspane and chocolate? I had these beautiful hearts printed. Uh, if I bend the um, plate even further, they will fall down. Finest Belgian chocolate, because for 3D printing, what is important is that you only use the best of materials. And I also heard that 3D printing is like a Black Forest Gatto, layer after layer. This is great on the International Day of Chocolate. A very warm welcome, good evening to the Symposium of Hector Feller Academy. 3D printing customized and at the push of a button. A very warm welcome to you in Karlsruhe and welcome to those watching us via live stream. Great to have you here. I'm Andrea Griezmann and I'm honored to accompany you through the evening. It will be a journey towards the future. Every year, Hector Fellow Academy is opening a window with a symposium like this, a window towards the future we can look through to understand what is science currently working on. And tonight, it's about 3D printing, it's about chocolate, and about much more. Near Ulm, there is a multi-family house printed with a 3D printer. Will there come a day when we print everything we need on demand? Will we be able to print human organs? That would be breathtaking, wouldn't it? Very exciting topics that you will hear tonight and you can ask questions, you can ask how it works. I will comment on this later on. And we look forward to the welcome address of the Vice President of KIT, Professor Alexander Wanner, welcome to you. Ms. Griezmann, thank you very much for this wonderful welcoming speech. Mr. and Mrs. Hector, Mr. Bleich, Mr. Schauer, members of the Hector Fellow Academy, Dr. Bitzner, welcome to all those interested in science, Welcome to the guests from culture, politics and society. Welcome to the students, ladies and gentlemen, dear audience. It's an honor and joy for me to welcome you as a representative of KIT to today's symposium of Hector Fellow Academy. All those here at Konzerthaus Karlsruhe and those who are watching this symposium via the live stream. I'd like to especially welcome the two speakers tonight. Professor Dwyer, thank you very much for donating your lunch break to us and speaking to us directly from New York. And uh, Mr. Wegner, you are not only here as a speaker, but as president of Hector Fellow Academy and host of this symposium you made an enormous contribution to make sure that for the first time this symposium is taking place in Karlsruhe. Thank you very much for this. The challenges of digitalized economy of the 21st century against the background of automation require new materials for more and more complex applications. New materials rely on the development of new materials and the two processes are influencing each other. One of the enormously modern technologies is 3D printing. It gives us enormous opportunities for different industries and also in medicine it finds a lot of different applications um, which are developed in an interdisciplinary manner. At KIT uh, a research university of Helmholtz Society, we have interdisciplinary work in eight centers. One is the Material Science Center, where researchers from life science, natural science, are working together to develop new materials and technologies from basic research up to the economic implementation. 
Our scientists are leading all over the world with 3D printing in microns, a size which the human eye cannot even see anymore. The Excellence Cluster 3D a meta made to order is making an enormous contribution here. The Excellence Cluster is supported by the federal government and together with the University of Heidelberg and KIT, it is a research initiative that you will hear more about in Professor Wegner's speech today. He is the spokesperson of this Excellence Cluster. The cluster supports the cooperation between physics, chemistry and engineering sciences and biology, focusing on the applications of 3D technology in life science. A structural element of the cluster I'd like to focus on is the Heike Graduate School Functional Materials. Here, master students and future PhDs can enter this area of science to make sure that young scientists are involved in top research as early as possible. Once you entered the building through the lobby, you were able to look at different areas of application of 3D printing and the reception later today will give you an opportunity to get more explanation about the latest technologies. Mm -hmm. I'm glad to uh, see the organization of exhibitions and uh, also performances. And I would like to thank the young scientists who look after all the different booths and are available for information. Use the opportunity to start discussions with the scientists tonight because events such as today's symposium of Hector Fellow Academy are very important to make interchange possible. For the further education of young scientists, such events are indispensable and very important to us as KIT. They are also a platform to involve young students in the exchange with society and they want to discuss social challenges with you and at the same time trigger political discourse. We want to build bridges towards the city of Karlsruhe and this is why KIT has a series of events called KIT in the Town Hall and we also have an information and transfer center called Triangle Open Space in the center of the city. I'd like to invite you to attend further events where scientists introduce their work. Scientific excellence does not only require open ears, but full hands as well. And after many years, KIT is in the uh, great position to know that Hector Fellow Academy has hands full of know-how and support. We are working together with Hector Fellow Academy and we enthuse young people for science. We support young talents and make scientific exchange possible. On behalf of KIT, I'd like to thank Hector Fellow Academy and the people uh, behind the scenes, especially Mr. and Mrs. Hector for the generous support. Thank you very much for this. I'd also like to thank the team of Hector uh, Fellow Academy for all their work in supporting young scientists. And thank you also for the organization of today's symposium. Now, as all of you, I also look forward to our agenda and I wish all of us an interesting evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Wanner, for the welcome address. 3D printing. Well, maybe you have something made by a 3D printer at home and you don't know maybe an artificial hip replacement or something um, that is part of dentist's work, maybe an implant or these transparent uh, tooth brackets which replace the brackets of the past. All this comes from a 3D printer. And then maybe in the future we will print something like this at home, what we need, a button that's missing or 
chocolate, if you urgently need it, of course, the best solution is a heart shape. And Professor Wanner, you mentioned the exhibition. If you didn't have the opportunity before, I'd like to recommend to take a closer look at it afterwards and get some explanation. It is really fascinating to look at the different printers, filament printers, which print marzipan or chocolate food printers, or the cube, I was able to get this. This was printed with a hard plastic printer. Different videos are available. For example, explain like I'm five. So explain as if I were a child of five years. And well, everybody can approach science in this way if people explain it in a way for us to understand because sometimes the topics are very complex. A video by Saskia Brown, for example, where she explains how she works on new materials for 3D printing and produces artificial molecules. I also talked to Dominic Beutlitz, who explained the optical pincers to me. And there is a student of the Hector seminar here with us. And uh, Mr. Volkmuth from KIT, he was the one who mentioned the example of the Black Forest Gateau. He is in charge of the exhibition. And Saskia Braun, Pascal Griefer and Tobias Messer. These are three young scientists of this cluster, Professor Wanner, you mentioned it, um, 3D Meta made to order the joint research cluster of KIT and Heidelberg University, a network of top people interdisciplinary who will take the 3D printing technology to the next level. So how do all of us benefit, you, every single one of us, regarding this research? An important question that is the main topic tonight. You may ask questions uh, also when you watch us online. And all of you here in the room, you can use this cube, which is our mobile phone. It does not come from a 3D printer, by the way. I uh, spy with my little eye. Well. This is something that the gentleman who will come to the stage now can say because he works in 3D printing in micron and micrometers. Nanos comes from the uh, Greek language. It's a dwarf and you know, a dwarf is very big compared to what we are talking about because we talk about structures that the human eye cannot even perceive any longer. Now look forward to the scientific host of the symposium professor uh, of the Institute of Applied Physics and um, the spokesman of the Cluster of Excellence 3D Meta Made to Order and president of the Hector Fellow Academy. When we talked beforehand, you told me, oh, you don't have to mention all this, but I think I should mention it at least once. So look forward to meeting Martin Wegener, ladies and gentlemen. Well, good evening. I am always very surprised when I read about 3D printing. And let's get started with my presentation with my slides. Like airplane wings, we talked about houses that were 3D printed, hip replacement organs, shoes, chocolate, pasta. Almost everything can be printed with a 3D printer. Tonight, we'll talk about two aspects. 3D printed organs from life science and application. Taltwea will talk about it later. And I would like to talk about this scale. We talk about technological applications in my presentation. Where are we headed towards with 3D printing? Well, with 3D printing, you can print three-dimensional objects, implement, realize, and otherwise. It would be difficult and even impossible, in most cases impossible, to produce. And that's what it is all about in science, doing new things one, hasn't, one couldn't do before. Oftentimes you do it with a 3D printer. That's how I started working in this field more than 20 years ago. If you think about applications, about commercialization of 3D printing, individualization is important. 
you know that from your inkjet printer at home, no matter whether it's a photography that you print once or 100 times or different photos, it always takes the same time, no matter whether it's always the same picture or another picture. Oftentimes, it is important to have individual obje objects. Think about hip replacement. We do not want a hip replacement process from, uh, from the shelf you want it to be adapted, made to order, tailor-made. You do not want a tooth that is available 25 times on the shelf. You want a tooth that fits you and that looks like the tooth that you just lost. Many examples like this exist. And if we continue, as Frau Griesmann mentioned, it also is about decentralization. Maybe one day you don't go into a shop and you have long delivery in supply chains. You simply print whatever you need in the shop or maybe one day in your home. That would change life, but this is a thing of the future. And I'd like to talk about the current time, current day and age. How does it work? 3D printing. It is an element of digitization of our world. First of all, you have to define what you want. You have to have it on your computer in a digital way, represent it in a digital way. You do it with so-called voxels. What is a voxel? I will use the term voxel. It's volume element. It's an artificial term in analogy to pixel, you all know the pixels, like your camera, your digital camera has pixels, or the pixels from your inkjet, it's picture elements, two-dimensional, a voxel is 3D elements, like you build a little vehicle, a little car, with those little voxel cubes, that's how you define it. You might say, Mr. Wegener, that sounds nice, but these voxels, they are too rough. Right, that's part of science. The voxel, the smallest unit, is supposed to be smaller and smaller so that we have a nice quality. So that is an important aspect. How do we implement it? Technically speaking, there will be many experts here in the room and they say, well, there are 100 different printers with thousands of different patterns and I simplify it. So people say, don't simplify it, but... Let me say it as follows. Only two ways to work, mechanically and optically. These are the two ways to do it. Mechanically, you have a little nozzle, a little opening, and through this opening, you have a liquid or chocolate or marzipan. And as you see here with a concrete printer, you, the nozzle prints the material. And then you move the nozzle head and you create your 3D object. So, nothing new really. Chocolate printer works like that. Chocolate printer you've seen. And your inkjet printer at home in, at your desk works like that. And a lot of work over decades was used. And we were stuck with these structural sizes amounting to 40 micrometers. So if you have no idea what that is, it's half the width of one of your human hairs. So you can hardly see it because it's so small if you print it at home. But for many applications, it is not good enough. And that's why we said, how can we have smaller and smaller structures? So we came up with this optical way of printing, as you see on your right-hand side. We do not work with a nozzle. We work with light. Light is being focused on this little white spot at your center. And here in the center, the light is turning a switch. So we change the material. The light spot is in a liquid. And as soon as the light switch is being switched, you turn the lever, it suddenly the material hardens and cures and it's getting hard. And then we have three dimensions controlled by your computer just the way you want it. And at the end, you use the liquid part that hardens and cures. Pretty simple. Where's the advantage of this optical method? We have two aspects. 
light can be focused on a smaller point as opposed to a physical nozzle. I talked about 40 micrometers, that's a normal size for a mechanical process. We have structures times 100 times 1000. So we are able to produce it with light because you can use light on these small scale activities. And something else sounds stupid, but light is lightweight. A nozzle has a weight. Have a look at this nozzle head. If you want to speed it up, you need force. And you can only do it up to a certain maximum speed. Light has no weight. So light moves with light speed. And it's not just a saying. Yes, you can move with light speed because light has no weight. And you cannot wait forever until this object is done and finished. There is another os aspect that I'd like to mention. It is not necessarily an advantage. Right at the center, it is pretty light. And you can see we have light below and above, and we don't want it. We want it to be very precise and clear cut, and I will talk about it in a moment. And this brings me to the next part of my presentation. I'd like to talk about the light switches. How does it work? How can we work? with the light and trigger of the material. This brings me to Albert Einstein, who taught us what to do with light. Light as part of particles and quantums. There was a work done by Albert Einstein in 2005, not for the theory of relativity, as many people think, but he said, just imagine light, we have particles, or photons. It depends on the color of the light. So the energy of the photons, which equals the length of the yellow arrow, has to fit the production energy of the light molecule in order to change and trigger off the light. So the molecule has two levels. So we have to bring it to the upper level to trigger off a chemical reaction leading to this curing, this hardening that I mentioned. So this process is not very probable. Less probable than you winning the lottery. How can we quantify? So we have a certain space, the absorption diameter so this just looks like this. Well, I'm not, I'm not a very good marksman. If I want to hit, so this is depends on the size, really. That's proportional to the size. And here again, to this disk, and here again, you have a size for your molecule. It's 10 times 15 square centimeters, 10 to the power of 15 centimeters, square centimeters. That's the geometrical size of a molecule at room temperature. You see the error here, and this is the molecule of your target. And this is my reference right now. Because Albert Einstein says, it doesn't work. This time it doesn't work. We need something else. We need something else and new ideas to do 3D printing with lights. We need Marie Goppard Meyer's idea. She wrote her PhD thesis in 1930. She talks about the theory of the two photon absorption. As you can see here, her argument was it should be possible to have two energy units, two photons, as we can symbolize by the two errors, and the transfer from one molecule to one aggregate to one state is easier, can be simplified by adding the energy of the two, and then it is allocated to the mo molecule. And she calculated the probability of this process, moved to the United States, worked in different areas, like in nuclear physics, and was a uh, winner of the Nobel Prize for Physics, the second woman winning the Nobel Prize for Physics. So let me do a little excursion. So she published this thesis back in 1931 it, in the hip journal at the time, Annalen der Physik. So 30 years, no one read what she wrote and published in this very renowned journal, Journal of Physics. And in 1961, after developing the laser, Wolfgang Kaiser, 
and the Bell Labs has proven her work, and another 30 years passed until people worked with these findings in the sense of the two-photon laser microscopy or 3D laser lithography, which is printing, another word for printing, to simplify it. So some politicians want the scientific research to bear fruit very, very soon. But as you see here, sometimes it takes a little while. And now things work. I'd like to talk about 3D laser nanoprinting. And one photon is not enough, as Albert Einstein says. One photon alone is not sufficient. We talked together with young students of Hector Academy. We did some simulations. And as you see, we will print a table. You will see it in a moment. It's a, print, a simple table with a square top and four legs. So at your left, one photon absorption. And at your right hand side, you can see a table with two photon absorptions, just like Marie Goppert Meyer suggests. Let's have a look at it. We'll get started with the legs of our table. And we have this light spot. Look to the right. This is the table. It's getting thicker. And at the right hand side, it looks like a table one can use. At your left hand side, it looks weird in shape. It doesn't look like a table you can use in real life. It has a lot of deformations. And that's the normal one photon absorption. So you cannot use it for real life for practical applications. And the effect is getting worse the more complicated the form is. So now it's easy to understand what you see at your left hand side. At the center of this light spot, it is light 100%. But you also see extensions to the left and right, as I said. So it can be 1% in size. Not too bad. But if you print it, if you see the laser focus, you collect this 1%, maybe 100 times. And then you have a 100% effect. And this is this thickening in the form here on top. And we don't want it. We want a neat form for our table. So now you use two photons. So that's a proportion to, in proportion of the intensity or to the power of the light power. And this 1% is suddenly smaller. It's just 1% of 1%, 10 times to the power of 4. And if you add it 100 times, you still don't have it. It's not 0, but 1% as opposed to 100%. So this is why the disturbances are so much smaller if you use Marie Goppert Meyer's two photon process. I would like to say thank you to the participants. We did this video for you. Both videos were done for you. I learned a lot. So the two photon absorption, a process where you have two light ones producing a molecule stimulating a molecule, how probable is it? Well, as I said before, we have the one photon process. It's less probable than you winning the lottery tonight. So a two photon process is as probable as winning the lottery in Germany and in France at the same day, two countries the same day. And you will say this will never happen, winning the lottery twice in one day. It hardly ever happens apart from you play the lottery all day long and draw a lot of lot of lots all day long. So we use lasers and we focus the lasers strongly. So many photons are working. This is like the lottery patches. So we have a medium performance of 10 milliwatt, not more than a laser pointer, not much more. I don't have a laser pointer, but this just gives you an idea. So we focus it. We have very short light impulses. And we focus on small impulses. And just imagine the intensity and the performance per space leads to one terawatt per square centimeter. It's difficult to imagine. It's the performance of 1,000 nuclear power plants. One nuclear power plant has a gigawatt of performance. Let's take 1,000 of those. And you focus the entire performance of the 1,000 nuclear power plants on a surface as big as my thumbnail 
oh my God, that hurts, I think. It's a, a enormous density of performance. Nothing dramatic happens because this is for a very short time and only in a very small defined space. But during that time, you have a lot of light quantum and photons. And now Marie Gopard Meyer is back. If you have a typical number for the two photon coefficients, it's GM for Gopard Meyer. That's her family name. And if we multiply, we have a space 10 to the power of 16 square centimeters. And what I talked and told, told you about normal absorption, it was 10 to the power of 15 square centimeters. We need a lot of, lot of light intensity, very high light intensity for this process of the two photon absorption. It works pretty well. And I'd like to talk about it. What can we do with a two photon absorption? How do we print? And in a second step, we can do it maybe differently so that the intensity isn't that high. What do we see here? That's a Nanoscribe printer. Nanoscribe is a startup coming from KIT, high tech from Karlsruhe, Karlsruhe KIT, that was back in 2014. Now it looks like that. Now you can use them for industrial applications. That's what it looks like today. And I'd like to show you example number one. What can you print with it? First example. Lenses, optical lenses, you might say that's a stupid example. These optical lenses are very small, as you can see on the scale, 15 micrometers, so the width of half a human hair. So this is important to see that the surface is very smooth. So just a couple of nanometers. Apart from that, it won't work as an optical lens because it'll scatter light. So it needs a very smooth surface. And you can do a lot of micro optics, for instance, for face recognition of your mobile phone. Ha very sophisticated optical lenses, and they are difficult to manufacture. And now in industrial applications, we start to work with these um, structures that we sometimes call 2.5D structures. So you produce an original and then you replicate it with this matrix of the structure and you kind of stamp it. So sometimes it's printed and sometimes it's not that easy to produce the master. And this is where two photon printers have their strength, but it is not yet 3D. That's why I come up with another example. That's from my colleague Harald Giesen in Stuttgart, Nanoscribe Technology from Karlsruhe, and they use our printing system. Again, we have three lenses, lens systems. At your right-hand side, you see the triplet system, three individual lenses, and they are cut. You will say nothing new, but have a look at the scales. We talk about a diameter of 150 micrometers. It's like a the width of two human hairs, and still it works pretty well. As you can see here, you can see the pictures right here. And again, it is very important to see that the surfaces is very smooth on the scale of just a couple of nanometers. And here, I wouldn't know how to produce it with any other type of technology. Very small lenses, where do you need it? For instance, for the optical class fiber, you print it on the end of the optical class fiber, and you might use it for endoscopy, for minimal invasive surgery. So you do not want to have huge objects. You need very small objects with precision, and you would like to see what happens during surgery. That's why we need these very small optical lenses. And my main point is, that's the only way of producing it. I can't think of any other way of doing it. Dass dann nur ein Material überhaupt verwendet wird. Das war in der Tat ein, so eine Art Plastik, ein Polymer, was durchsichtig ist und so ähnliche Eigenschaften hat wie Fensterglas auch. Ähm, kann man auch viele verschiedene Materialien umsetzen durch den 3D-Druck. Wenn Sie sich an das Foyer erinnern, das war da nicht der Fall, da wurde auch immer nur ein Material gedruckt. Wie kann ich da hinkommen, viele verschiedene Materialien verdrucken zu können? 
Und da ist vielleicht ganz nützlich, man schaut sich mal an, was bei Ihnen zu Hause eigentlich passiert. Ich habe das lange Zeit gar nicht verstanden, was da passiert im Tintenstrahldrucker. Da sind so drei Kartuschen drin, die man andauernd austauschen muss. Also salopp gesagt, rot, gelb und blau. Und irgendwie wird aus diesen drei Farbkartuschen werden dann ganz, ganz viele Farben generiert. Wie funktioniert das eigentlich? Ich habe immer gedacht, die werden gemischt irgendwie. Nee, die werden nicht gemischt. Die werden durch eine Mikrostrukturierung hergestellt. Also Sie können mit drei Grundfarben tausende von Farben generieren. Und die Hoffnung bei uns wäre jetzt, dass ich irgendwie durch ein paar wenige Grundmaterialien eben auch tausende von verschiedenen Materialeigenschaften erreichen kann. Wie funktioniert das beim Tintenstrahldrucker? Ich mache es mal für das Beispiel Übergang von blau nach gelb hier ganz einfach. Wenn Sie blau drucken können, ein Pixel blau, und wenn Sie gelb drucken können, dann können Sie auch ein Schachbrettmuster drucken wie das hier. Und jetzt kommt der Witz, wenn Sie die Felder des Schachbretts immer und immer kleiner machen, bis Sie irgendwann gar nicht mehr erkennen können, dass da Felder sind, weil die so klein werden, dass Sie die nicht sehen, dann nehmen Sie eine ganz andere Farbe wahr. Und genauso funktioniert das. Wenn Sie eine Lupe nehmen oder ein Mikroskop und schauen sich irgendeine Fotografie, die Sie mit dem Tintenstrahldrucker ausgedruckt haben, an, dann werden Sie feststellen, das sind ganz komplizierte, mikrostrukturierte Muster, die, wenn Sie die weit weg halten, dann plötzlich aussehen wie eine bunte Fotografie. Durch Mikrostrukturierung erreicht man ganz viele verschiedene Farben. Und dann kann man halt vielleicht die Idee haben, ja, vielleicht kriegen wir durch Mikrostrukturierung auch ganz viele unterschiedliche Materialien mit Eigenschaften, die vielleicht ganz anders sind als die Ingredienzien, die Zutaten, die wir reinstecken in die Kartuschen von so einem 3D-Drucker. Also hier nochmal diese Idee, wenige Materialkartuschen, aber viele Eigenschaften dadurch, dass wir mikrostrukturieren. Das ist nur mein, mein Lieblingsgeschäft, darüber könnte ich Ihnen zehn Stunden lang was erzählen, das möchte ich aber nicht tun. Ich möchte Ihnen ein Beispiel zeigen, was ich ganz eindrucksvoll finde von der Herstellung her und äh, was den Punkt macht, dass man wirklich ganz andere Eigenschaften bekommen kann durch die Mikrostrukturierung. Es geht um die Kompressibilität, wie gut Sie Objekte zusammendrücken können oder nicht. Und ich habe in der Schule gelernt, dass die Kompressibilität immer positiv sein muss. Das heißt eigentlich was ganz Einfaches, wenn Sie das Material nehmen und Sie setzen es einem gewissen Druck aus, einem gewissen Luftdruck aus oder einem gewissen Wasserdruck aus, dann wirken die ganzen Kräfte nach innen und dementsprechend wird das Objekt kleiner, das Volumen schrumpft und das nennen wir positive Kompressibilität. Ich habe sogar peinlicherweise in vielen Vorlesungen erzählt, dass das so sein müsse, aus gewissen physikalischen Gesetzen heraus, aus Stabilität, aus Energieerhaltung heraus. Stimmt aber alles gar nicht. Wenn man das geschickt macht, kann man auch Materialien bekommen, die sich ausdehnen, wenn sie sie einem größeren Druck aussetzen. Und das sähe dann so aus wie auf der rechten Seite. Also technisch hieße das dann eine negative Kompressibilität zu erhalten. Sie drücken auf das Material durch einen höheren Luftdruck und es wird größer, verrückterweise. Wie kann das funktionieren? Ich zeige Ihnen zunächst mal das Prinzip. Wir machen künstliche Materialien, die so ein bisschen aussehen wie Kristalle, halt nur nicht mit richtigen Atomen, sondern mit künstlichen Atomen, wenn Sie das so möchten. Das sieht jetzt zunächst mal relativ einfach aus hier. Wir haben kleine Würfelchen. Und diese ganzen Würfelchen sind verbunden durch diese lustigen Ärmchen, die Sie dazwischen sehen. Erstmal nichts großartig Besonderes. Vielleicht wird es klarer, wenn ich mir mal einen von diesen Würfeln hier herauspicke, aus denen dieses Material aufgebaut ist. Aber Sie sehen eigentlich weiterhin nur einen Würfel mit lustigen Ärmchen, die hier nach oben, unten und allen Richtungen zeigen. Wie funktioniert das Ding? Das kann man eigentlich nur erkennen, wenn man den Würfel mal aufschneidet im Computer. Und dann ist der wesentliche Aspekt, dass diese Würfel hohl sind an dieser Stelle. Sie haben Wände, die aus dünnen Membranen bestehen. In dem Beispiel, das ich Ihnen gleich zeige, sind diese Membranen nur ungefähr ein Mikrometer dick. Man braucht also die Möglichkeit, so kleine Strukturen drucken zu können. Und jetzt passiert das Folgende. Wenn Sie den Luftdruck außen erhöhen, dann führt das zu Kräften hier auf allen diesen Seitenflächen und die werden nach innen gedrückt, so wie das hier zu sehen ist. Ja. Was ist daran groß überraschend? And uh, well, this is no surprise. Look at what the arms do. So I go back and forth and back and forth. The pressure increases and the sides 
bend towards the inside, the arms move towards the outside. Let me move backwards and forwards. With higher air pressure, the arms move towards the outside and one cell is bigger than before. And if you add several cells, all of the material will expand and you turn the behavior upside down compared to what we see in nature. Under the electron microscope, you see a structure that we produced with 3D laser printing. Now I can tell you, well, I don't know which other technology I could use to produce this. By the way, this is the truth, I don't know. The cubes are 50 microns and the walls are very, very, very thin. And the thing is that I can use this as a meta ink. I can have microstructures with different properties. Now let me show you the experiment. On the top right hand side you see the pressure and if there is a high pressure level, air pressure up to three bar, this is like in a small balloon, if you increase the air pressure the material expands. If you take a close look you see what the arms are doing. They move towards the outside using the mechanism I told you about and the material properties can not only be changed a little bit, but you can completely change them by way of microstructuring. You can use uh, such things for electronics uh, to change mechanical properties to order, so to say, by way of microstructuring, similar to what the paints do in your inkjet printer. Now, if I imagine I have devices composed of different uh, unit cells, of course the printing speed will become very important. Now, the devices you saw in the lobby, they are very, very slow. So, it takes a lot of patience to produce complex structures. So, we work very hard to make sure we can increase the printing speed. Now I'm going to show you something I'm not supposed to show. I'd like to show you an overview of printing technologies and their properties. Otherwise I cannot compare it. Now this uh, terrible diagram with many different printing technologies by way of symbols and colors categorized by printing speed that you see shown here. And the unit is how many of the voxels we can print per second. It starts with one voxel per second, which is quite slow, up to 10 million or 100 million voxels. And the other axis is um, how precise the structures are, the reciprocal size of the voxels. If you think this is very strange, take a look at this. We start with uh, 10 microns, then uh, 100, 10 microns, and you find some familiar phenomena here. The filament printer you see outside would be about here in the diagram. Several hundred voxels per second can be printed and the precision of the structures is a few hundred microns, more than a hair width. And there are other technologies with the uh, two photon printing I'm referring to. It is shown in red here and in Karlsruhe, we have printing speeds of up to 10 million voxels per second. If this figure doesn't explain anything, uh, the great disks um, were supposed to be very fast. They read at a speed of 30 million bit per second. We transfer digital information uh, and we have around 10 million bit or 10 million voxel per second. Uh, from software to hardware. And again, if you want to have sub-micron structures, this is what you want to have for optical applications. There are not that many alternatives to do so. Um, and, um, well, I will not talk about the competing features down there. If you're interested to find out more, you find it on the internet, uh, the website of our excellence cluster, what about the different printing technologies. The very, very fast device I talked about, you see it in the lab, it, it is not sold, it's just for experiments. 
I will turn it around. And this brings me to the second part of my presentations. I uh, want to get rid of the, um, the structures again. Now, why do I want to get rid of them? Because the lasers we need to reach the high intensity I mentioned before are relatively big and expensive. The price of a laser is around 100,000 euro and if you get started here it will not be able to produce mass products very soon. So how can we get rid of it? Albert Einstein wasn't enough. Um, the uh, colleague, the female colleague wasn't either. So what can we do? Well, a relatively new process was developed in Karlsruhe last year, uh, was brought up to maturity and we call it two-stage absorption. And I'd like to compare it to the two-photon absorption I mentioned before, which means that simultaneously two light particles, two photons, are used, they are absorbed by one molecule, they excite the molecule, the molecule will then trigger a chemical reaction which uh, leads to the solidification I mentioned before. And if you look at this um, image for a little longer, you will be surprised. What does it mean? This arrow, you know, points to, to nothing. It's as if you wanted to step on a step that doesn't exist, you would probably stumble. And this is what makes this process so unlikely, as I said before. And our idea was to introduce a step, an additional step, to make sure that the light takes two steps here to come from the unexcited molecule to the excited molecule. And the smart thing here is that this can be a normal single photon process, according to Albert Einstein, which is more likely. Then we have this interim stage with a certain life cycle. You can wait. And from here, a second excitement process brings you to this top level. And this is where the chemical reaction takes place. What is the different difference? In both cases, two photons will be absorbed. And uh, it's a square shape and you can cut off uh, these little tails. What is the difference? Here, the two photons need to be absorbed simultaneously. It's as if you had to win the lottery in Germany and in France on the same day. Here you can say, okay, I win the lottery in Germany now and you have one more year to win the lottery in France. Doesn't sound more likely, but is unbelievably more likely because you have more time. And uh, in our world, it's one million times more efficient. So all of a sudden you can use different types of lasers. Let me wrap up again. And I'd like to point out that uh, chemistry is very important, not only physics here. So you need specific molecules. Here you see one example of a molecule and you see the laser focus and you want to trigger a chemical reaction here. The molecules here uh, are excited at the offsets here, but where you have the brightest area, they are really excited very much. The two stages are managed. The molecule is broken, is fragmented, and the fragments trigger the chemical reaction solidification, and then you can continue. And the smart thing is we can use smaller lasers that uh, you have to touch with a pincer, and even this laser is way too big for what we want to do here but the light areas can be minute. You see a scale of 100 microns here, and uh, nanometers, sorry, and with a resolution of 100 nanometers, printing is possible because we use blue light rather than the red light I mentioned before. And let me show you some examples from the electron microscope, otherwise you cannot see the structures because they are minute. These are just a few examples, uh, some uh, spiral suspensions or small ships. Uh, this is a kind of um, sports in the 3D community. You probably saw it outside. Um, small ships are being printed. I think this is the smallest ship that has ever been printed on Earth. And the KIT uh, logo can be printed as well here, a little bigger. And the important thing is that we ha only need minute laser performance, uh, less than what you can trigger with the laser pointer here. 
and so the technology is less expensive and you can um, maybe print um, in parallel but um, in this public lecture I'm not supposed to talk about this for legal reasons and here you see other shapes maybe you saw this before this is a kind of um, wood stack structure and this is thousand times smaller than what you saw outside in the lobby and again it only takes a minute performance 45 uh, micron watt and we are very proud of this because we think this will mean a lot of progress. To us it's important to understand what the structures look like on the inside. This is not easy if you have such a small scale and the cooperation with Heidelberg University helped a lot. We have technologies to cut them apart although they are only one nanometer big and you can make sure that the inside structures look the way they are supposed to look, although they are minute. And this brings me to the end of my presentation. I'd like to say thank you in two different ways. First of all, to the members of my group, and I list, didn't list all of them, only those who actively contributed to my presentation. And underneath you see the cooperation with many other scientific groups of KIT, Heidelberg University and many other institutions. This is the only way to uh, do such a thing. And this is one of the important things of our excellence clusters to support cooperation like this. And I'd like to thank for the support to Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft, um, the Hector Fellow Academy and all the other representatives you see here by way of the different logos. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Martin Wegener, for this presentation. Fascinating insight. I admit that with the terrible diagram, I uh, ran the risk of losing it. But yes, apart from this fascinating, what fascinates me is this really, really minute form of thinking big. And this is the great thing about science, thinking big, thinking about things you cannot imagine. This is the only way to create something new. The gentleman you'll meet now thinks without any limits and he has received many awards for this. He deals with regenerative medicine and tissue engineering. In 2019, the world turned its attention to him with a heart. Well, all of us have a heart, but he printed a heart. A heart printed by a 3D printer, the prototype of a human heart. And uh, I still can't believe it. And I'm glad that he will explain everything live from New York Professor at the Institute for Biotechnology of Tel Aviv University, Tal Dwyer, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we do at the lab. Um, uh, uh, so the lab is uh, working on tissue engineering applications. We're engineering different types of uh, tissues from the heart, brain, spinal cord, intestine, kidneys, retina, and, and even other, just, uh, oops. Um, and, and even other uh, uh, tissues. So uh, what is tissue engineering? What is the concept of uh, uh, this uh, uh, field of research? So in tissue engineering, we have a patient with a defected organ, as you can see here on its uh, left side. And what we do in tissue engineering, we're engineering a substitute tissue in the lab that can, uh, uh, can uh, uh, work and function as the other uh, 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 tissue, as the uh, normal tissue. And then what we do, we remove the defected tissue from the uh, patient. And of course, as you can see under sterile conditions, we're uh, transplanting the engineered tissue that, uh, uh, to uh, regain function of the uh, organ. But how do we really do this uh, 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 magic? What do we do in tissue engineering? So we take uh, cells, preferably from the patient, because we do not want to provoke an immune response. And then we cultivate uh, uh, these cells in uh, petri dishes and flasks to uh, expand their uh, number. 
then we need to create a tissue. And tissues in the body are not just the cells. The cells are very important. However, the biomaterial in between the cells is uh, important as well. Uh, it is called the extracellular matrix. And what we do in the lab, we develop different types of uh, uh, biomaterials. Uh, these should be three-dimensional materials, porous materials to accommodate the cells. So we can introduce the cells into these uh, materials. We can add gross factors, uh, small molecules, nanoparticles. And essentially, we're doing everything we can to allow the cells to uh, assemble into a functioning tissue, which can then be taken and transplanted on the defected organ. So when we talk about uh, the heart, and this is an example for all tissues, uh, we, uh, uh, we need to uh, have enough uh, cells. And with the heart, we uh, do not have enough cells to spare. We cannot take pieces of uh, heart tissues, take the cells and form a tissue from these cells. So what we do uh, in the lab, we are using induced pluripotent stem cells. These are cells that are taken from uh, patients. Uh, these can be skin cells or any other cells. They are reprogrammed by genetic engineering to become embryonic-like stem cells. Then what we do, we uh, mimic the embryonic development for the different tissue types or cell types that we wish. So we're uh, creating different uh, cell types, as you can see here. And then we can create uh, tissues, either two-dimensional uh, constructs, which are very thin and cannot really uh, regenerate the injured uh, heart, or we can create cardiac patches, three-dimensional cardiac patches to be transplanted on the left ventricle of the defected heart, for example, or the future, uh, in the future, we will uh, engineer whole hearts to be implanted instead of the, uh, of the defected heart, uh, and then we will not need uh, to use uh, donors' uh, hearts. So when we're talking about the biomaterials that can uh, be used, this can be in different uh, forms. For example, they can be hydrogels, which are a mixture of uh, polymer and water. And uh, here we mix the cells inside the hydrogel. We can then inject these uh, uh, hydrogels or transplant them in the body. We can also use the uh, preformed scaffolds, which are some kind of uh, sponges, porous uh, materials, as you can see in the middle. We seed the cells into these uh, pores, and then we can uh, transplant these uh, uh, patches. We can also create uh, uh, fibers, uh, as you can see here, fibrous uh, materials that really mimic the collagen fibers of the body. So we seed the cells onto these uh, fibers, and then we can uh, transplant them. So initially, when we wanted to recapitulate the uh, matrix of the uh, heart, we didn't know how it looks like. So what we've done at the, at the lab, we took pig's hearts and with the phys uh, physical, chemical and biological processes, we removed all the cells and we were left only with the extracellular matrix as you can see here. And what we were able to see was that there is one big mass of uh, fiber uh, populations. So there are microfibers, nanofibers, aligned fibers, randomly oriented fibers, and uh, initially, we want to evaluate what's uh, the different uh, fiber populations role. What do they do? So synthetically, we created in the lab the microfibers, the nanofibers, the aligned fibers, the randomly oriented fibers. And we grew cells on top of these uh, uh, biomaterials. And I'll show two examples of how the cells behave differently when we uh, seed them or let them grow on different biomaterials. So for example, when we talk about the random, random oriented uh, fibers, the cells are not in uh, uh, any direction. When we use the aligned fibers, you can see that the cells, the cardiac cells here in uh, uh, pink, uh, they are aligned. And this is extremely important because uh, this way, the cells can propagate the electrical signal nicely from one spot to another. Another example is the effect of uh, fiber diameter. So for example, we can create the nanofibers, one micrometer fibers, and uh, five micrometer fibers. And the word nano uh, is a buzzword in the last uh, 10, 15 years. Uh, if you write it in a grant uh, application, uh, you increase the chances of acceptance at least in uh, 50%. Uh, 
However, the cells, the cardiac cells at least, they do not like these uh, fibers. As you can see on the smaller fibers, they are rounded, they're not elongated, and they cannot really uh, transfer the signal nicely from one spot to another. On the bigger fibers, you can see that the cells are more elongated, and this is extremely important. So when we take uh, the morphology of the biomaterial into account and other things that I haven't spoken about, for example, the mechanical properties of the biomaterials or the biochemical content of the biomaterials, we can create cardiac patches such as this one. This is a few uh, centimeters in diameter, a few millimeters in thickness, and it contracts nicely in the lab for a long period of time without external stimulation. This is what it does in, in the lab. So we can now take these uh, cardiac patches and transplant them onto the uh, uh, defected heart to uh, regain function. However, uh, what we are able to see that uh, there is a nice regeneration after one month, but if we wait enough, there is a really nice rejection of these cardiac patches because uh, the biomaterials that were used initially were either synthetic or natural that did not come from their body. And these provoked an immune response that later on was translated to rejection of the patches. So people thought, well, let's uh, not use uh, synthetic materials. Let's use animals' materials. We'll take uh, materials from animals, remove the cells. We will be left only with the biomaterial, the extracellular matrix, and this will not provoke an immune response. So uh, a few years ago, we've shown that uh, even though that there are uh, millions of uh, 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 people that already received pigs matrices in the world, uh, these pigs matrices, they're uh, really not uh, uh, biocompatible because there are certain antigens, for example, like this sugar alpha-gal that is present in pigs and we humans, we do not have it. Another thing is that uh, uh, the uh, extra serum matrix proteins that we do share with the pigs or other animals, uh, they are different between us and, uh, and the pigs, for example. So here you can see that collagen 4, one of uh, the collagens, uh, has 37% uh, difference in the uh, uh, amino acid sequence, meaning that it folds differently, the protein itself, and then it will provoke an immune response. So based on these, uh, uh, these findings, we thought, well, we need to find a biomaterial that is completely, that can completely match the uh, uh, biomaterials of the patient. And for that, what we decided to do is to take fatty tissue from the patient. Uh, from this uh, tissue, we remove the cells, these fat cells. They are reprogrammed by genetic engineering to become stem cells. Uh, and the biomaterial is further processed to become an autologous, meaning a self biomaterial. Then we put the cells inside this biomaterial and we can differentiate uh, the cells to become any cell type that we wish. And then we have complete autologous biomaterial that will not be rejected or a complete autologous tissue that will not be rejected from the body. And if we look at cardiac uh, cells, this is the biomaterial, the autologous material. The cells really, they like this uh, material because it is uh, made of collagen and sugars and other things that the uh, cells really uh, like. We can also create blood vessels within these uh, tissues and these patches, they contract nicely in the lab. So if we compare the immune response of these materials, to uh, materials uh, uh, from pigs, for example, what we initially did was to simulate the immune response uh, of humans. We took uh, blood cells, uh, immune cells from uh, humans. I will not go into all the details. So we took the cells, we incubated them with the different biomaterials, either from pigs or from humans, either autologous or from other humans. And what we were able to see was uh, two things. First, that there is a huge difference between pigs' materials and human materials in terms of uh, 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 inflammation and uh, later on rejection. And also that there is a difference between the different donors, meaning that there is a need for an autologous material, uh, a patient-specific material. We also uh, shown it in uh, animals, showing that the autologous materials, the ones that comes from the same patient, provoke less immune response. 
And then we can take these cardiac patches, uh, they're now autologous, we can transplant them on the uh, defected heart, as you can see, and you can see two things from this uh, movie. First of all, you can see that the, uh, there's an open chest surgery here, and the patches are uh, secured to the heart with uh, two stitches. We'll deal with the stitches, which are not really ideal later on, uh, but for now, I would like to say a few things about the, the fact that uh, there's an open chest surgery, and this is not ideal because the patient just had a heart attack. We do not want to have another uh, surgery. So what uh, we've decided to do was to take these uh, materials from the patient and create from them thermoresponsive hydrogels, meaning uh, biomaterial that uh, will be liquid in room temperature. Now we can mix the cells here. And in 37 degrees, the temperature of the body, after injection, it will solidify and form the tissue in the body. So now what can we do with this uh, approach? So we can take the um, material, this uh, uh, tissue biopsy from the patient. We remove the cells and reprogram the cells to become embryonic-like stem cells. And the extracellular matrix is a process to a personalized hydrogel. Now we put the cells, these stem cells, in these hydrogels, and then we can create any tissue that uh, we wish just by mimicking the embryonic development of the specific organ. So for example, we can uh, uh, create adipogenic implants for uh, reconstructive surgeries. We can create motor neuron implants for spinal cord injury, cortical implants for brain trauma, dopaminergic implants for Parkinson, and cardiovascular implants for cardiovascular diseases. And we can even use more advanced technologies such as microfluidics and 3D printing to create more complex tissue. And based on this approach, we uh, recently formed Matricelf, uh, which is a spin-off company from uh, Tel Aviv University. So here you can see the cardiac uh, implants that uh, they were uh, fat cells uh, uh, a few weeks before, and now they became uh, cardiac uh, cells and cardiac patches that are functional. You can see it here that they contract and they transfer the electrical signal nicely. When we take these cardiac patches or these uh, tissues and inject them to uh, uh, mice hearts that uh, had heart attacks, we can elevate the ejection fraction, meaning that we can um, regenerate the function of the heart. As you can see in small animals, we did the same thing with the larger animals, with the pigs, and we've shown that uh, it works uh, perfectly. So what else can we do with these uh, materials, these uh, uh, injectable materials and with these uh, patient-specific cells? So I've mentioned that we can uh, do uh, 3D printing uh, and we're not just printing uh, uh, tissues, we're pr printing patient-specific tissues. So what we do here, we look at the CT image of the patient. This is the left ventricle. Uh, this is where the uh, ischemic area is. What we do, we isolate the blood vessels. We transfer this, uh, uh, this architecture of blood vessels to the computer, as you can see here. And then uh, we can go to 3D print the tissue. However, we do not have enough blood vessels because the CT image cannot give us the smaller blood vessels. So what we initially do before we go to the 3D printers, we do some mathematical modeling to uh, ensure that uh, there is enough blood vessels within the cardiac uh, uh, tissue that we want to print. Once we optimize it, we can go to the printer and what we do, we're printing patient-specific cells with uh, patient-specific uh, materials, cardiac cells uh, for the cardiac tissue, blood vessel forming cells such as endothelial cells and smooth muscle cells are printed uh, inside to create the uh, blood vessels. And eventually we get a cardiac patch, as you can see here with the blood vessels, which fits nicely the cellular uh, uh, content of the patient the biochemical content of the patient and also the anatomy of the patient because it was printed according to the blueprint of the uh, uh, defected uh, heart. And this is a cross section of one blood vessel that was printed within this patch. And this is uh, about uh, 50 to 100 micrometer in uh, diameter. It's a really fine uh, uh, printing here. There are so many blood vessels like that in the patch. 
and the cardiac patches there they are functional you can see here with these two uh, movies that they transfer the electrical signal this is in green on top of the uh, blood vessel this is one blood vessel and this is the entrance to the blood vessel to, so everything is contracting nicely in the lab and ready for transplantation without provoking an immune response we can also perfuse different types of uh, uh, drugs and see how these affect uh, the tissue, so it helps us to uh, screen different types of uh, uh, drugs, new drugs, uh, before uh, reaching the clinic or before reaching clinical trials, which are very expensive. And this is in collaboration with the uh, buyer. We checked using this approach uh, different uh, drugs, and uh, we saw how they affect uh, the heart. So up to, up to now, we've printed the uh, uh, three-dimensional patches, which are three-dimensional, but they're very limited in, the, uh, in their uh, uh, structure. They're not volumetric structure. And if we want to move on to print uh, uh, more advanced tissues or more organs, uh, organ-like tissues, uh, we need a different approach because otherwise the tissue where we uh, uh, print it in layers, it will collapse if we print volumetric uh, organs. So what we decided to do here is to develop an approach where we print into uh, um, a cap of uh, really small nanoparticles. And these nanoparticles, they stabilize the uh, tissue that we print, all the volumetric tissues. And after we solidify the tissue in 37 degrees, we can uh, uh, add another material that will dissolve all the small particles and we will be left only with the uh, volumetric uh, structure already after it is uh, solidified. So we developed this approach and uh, with that, we were able to uh, print the first uh, human heart. This is a small scale human heart with the, uh, the major blood vessels in uh, blue, as you can see here. And this is the, the printed structure during the uh, uh, printing. You can see here the chambers of the heart and the major blood vessels. These are endothelial cells and smooth muscle cells. And here in uh, blue, in uh, red, we have the cardiac cells. And this is the end product, as you can see, a human heart, a small scale human heart, a rabbit sized uh, heart that uh, uh, is contracting. However, it's not contracting synchronously. Initially, it was not contracting uh, synchronously because uh, we needed to teach the cells how to work uh, synchronously. So we could do that in uh, two ways. One of the ways to do that was to uh, mature these hearts in specialized uh, bioreactors. So we placed the heart, as you can see here in this cup, and we circulated the culture medium with all the growth factors and other nutrients through the blood vessels. And we use the stimulator to uh, pace these uh, hearts in the lab. So this was one approach. Another approach was to use the body as the bioreactor. So we actually transplanted these uh, uh, hearts in the animals in parallel to the, uh, to the natural heart. So there was a circulation, blood circulation through these uh, hearts. And eventually what we were able to see uh, using these two approaches, basically that the uh, human heart that was printed could contract nicely in the lab. This is a, a few centimeters uh, uh, here, three centimeters and a centimeter and a half. And it contracts nicely like that in the lab and transfer the electrical signal nicely, as you can see here. We can also use parts of these uh, hearts, for uh, example, to uh, study conduction disorders. Well, what we've done, and this is in collaboration with uh, Leo Gebson's uh, lab at the Technion in Israel. So we've printed the atria, uh, as you can see here. Uh, here it con contracts nicely in the lab. And what we can do, we can study conduction disorders. We can add different drugs, and we can see how these drugs affect patient's own tissue. Um, so this was about the, the heart, but uh, I, I've mentioned that we can uh, work on other uh, tissues as well. And now I'll show a few slides on the uh, spinal cord uh, implants that we create in the lab. So we use the same approach where we take this uh, fatty tissue from the patient 
We take the cells, we create uh, embryonic-like stem cells from these cells. The ECM is processed again to become a personalized hydrogel. And then we mix the cells in the hydrogel. And instead of mimicking the embryonic development of the heart, we now uh, mimicking the embryonic development of the spinal cord to create spinal cord implants. And then we're implanting uh, these uh, 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 tissues. So here you can see that these uh, uh, tissues that a month before they used to be, oops, they used to be uh, fat cells. Now they are uh, neurons, the neurons of the uh, uh, spinal cord, motor neurons. And uh, uh, we transplanted these uh, uh, implants in uh, animals that uh, were uh, that had injured spinal cord, which means that they were paralyzed. And what we were able to see was uh, this is the MRI of these uh, implants. This is the implant group. You can see that we were able to use this technology to regenerate the injured spinal cord. And if we look at the animals that were treated, that were not treated with this uh, uh, technology, you can see here that they walk and one of their legs is not really operating. It's not putting pressure on one of these legs. This is leg one, two, three, and four. And when we use the uh, implant, the full implant uh, with the hydrogel and the cells, uh, all the animals look like that. They were able to regenerate the injured spinal cord. And this is in a chronic uh, injury. And this is quantification of uh, this uh, uh, step, meaning that uh, we were able to regenerate the injured spinal cord uh, using this technique. And we are now working uh, in the company towards clinical trials, which we hope to be in two, two and a half years uh, in these trials in, uh, in Israel. Sometimes we do not need to uh, have uh, uh, full tissues. Sometimes we just need some cells to be injected, for example, in uh, Parkinson's disease. So, uh, but if we just inject the cells, what we, uh, uh, what we see is that uh, most of the cells, if they're not with the supporting material, they will uh, uh, die after transplantation, after injection. So what we decided to do was to 3D print a microfluidic device that we can uh, uh, basically inject the hydrogel, as you can see here, with the cells. And here we inject oil. And when we mix uh, hydrogel, meaning a, a water uh, solution, uh, with the oil, we can create emulsions, as you can see here. And this is from the patient's own materials and patient's own cells. We heat it up to 37 degrees, and then we remove these uh, droplets with cells from the, uh, from the oil. And as you can see, we have many, many of these uh, uh, cellular droplets that now can be grown. These are dopaminergic uh, implants for uh, Parkinson's disease. Uh, so uh, uh, we grow these uh, implants, as you can see here, these are markers of uh, dopaminergic uh, cells that are used for uh, Parkinson's. This is after 90 days in uh, culture in the lab. They secrete dopamine, which is the, the, the molecule that is needed to regenerate Parkinsonian uh, brains. Uh, and we're now working on uh, animal models to regenerate uh, the brain. So again, this is the same technology we're just uh, uh, differentiating the cells to a different cell type to dopaminergic uh, neurons. We can create also cortical implants, as you can see here, for brain trauma, and these are functional. We can create retinal implants as well, and uh, uh, we can basically create any tissue that we wish. So now we're going back a little bit uh, uh, to the heart, and we're talking about, uh, uh, again about the electrical signal of the heart. Uh, so when we use biomaterials, most of them are not really conducting. And if we grow cells, perhaps they will not uh, uh, transfer the electrical signal nicely through the biomaterial because uh, this biomaterial is insulating. So what we've decided to do in the lab is to incorporate gold nanowires, they are conducting uh, materials, to incorporate them in the biomaterials, uh, either by printing or just by casting them. And now the, uh, the cells can interact with each other through these uh, uh, gold nanowires and transfer the electrical signal nicely. So here you can see cells without the gold nanowires and you can see that they're not really synchronized. 
And once we use the gold nanowires, everything is contracting uh, together, as you can see here. And this is quantification of what we've done when we took the patient's own materials, we added gold nanoparticles. Essentially, we took a material that is uh, natural and not conducting, and it became fully conducting material with all the biological motives that it uh, uh, had before. And it works nicely with uh, cardiac cells. It works nicely with neurons as well. Once we create these uh, fibers with gold nanoparticles on top, you can see that already after three days, the neurons are sending uh, uh, extended neurites, uh, really long neurites, uh, towards each other. And this is extremely important when we're talking about regenerating the spinal cord or the, uh, 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 or the brain. We can also use this approach of the gold nanoparticles, not just to uh, enhance the electrical coupling between cells, but also to uh, absorb uh, toxic molecules such as reactive oxygen species. And we can also use these uh, gold nanoparticles to image the patch coverage, meaning after we uh, transplant it, we want to know that we cover the entire uh, scar tissue that is formed in the heart or in other tissues. And this allows us to use MRI and to, uh, or a CT and evaluate where the patch is and where the scar tissue is. If you remember, I've, I've shown before that we can, uh, that we transplant the cardiac patches. Uh, we use stitches and stitches are not, uh, not the ideal uh, way of uh, uh, securing the patch to the heart because there can uh, be bleeding and, and, and uh, this is not ideal. So what we decided to do is to use gold uh, nanoparticles uh, um, and specifically gold uh, nanorods. Um, and if you synthesize these uh, gold uh, nanorods in the, in the right uh, uh, ratio, this can, uh, um, uh, you can illuminate uh, them with near IR, which is a safe uh, wavelength and uh, uh, penetrate deep in the body and they abs uh, absorb the light and they convert it to a thermal energy, which will allow to uh, uh, weld the tissue to the heart without the need for sutures. So uh, uh, this is what we've done. We've incorporated these gold nanorods on the edges of the uh, cardiac patch, illuminated it in near IR, and then it was stuck nicely to the heart after 30 seconds of uh, illumination without the need for uh, sutures. And this is how it looks. Again, uh, the cardiac patch on the heart. And here you can see electron uh, microscope. Uh, this is the heart and this is the patch and this is the integration point. And you can see that it is well integrated without uh, harming the uh, tissue. Last uh, series of uh, projects that I'm going to talk about is uh, what we call uh, uh, cyborg tissues, uh, the integration of electronics with engineered tissues. And we started this project not because it was uh, fun and cool to integrate electronics with uh, living systems, because we initially wanted to evaluate uh, if the cells are alive within our uh, uh, cardiac tissues that we engineer, if they're uh, uh, propagating the electrical signal nicely, if they're synchronized or not. So what we've done, we've uh, uh, created either by uh, printing or other approaches, uh, nanowired mesh devices, uh, nanoelectronic devices, which were porous. We incorporated them with electrospun uh, fibers. And eventually we had uh, uh, 3D matrices with many, many nanosensors within. So when we cultured cardiac cells on these uh, biomaterials, we could, uh, here are the cardiac cells, we could immediately see on the computer what's the function of the tissue. This is just one electrode, but we had many, many electrodes like that. Uh, so we could see the function of the tissue. We could add drugs and see how these uh, drugs affect the tissue, as you can see here. So it was a, a really nice uh, uh, project, a really nice publication and a great uh, patent for us. But it wasn't enough because in this case, what we were able to see was uh, just to uh, sense the function of the tissue. But what if the cells were not working properly? What if they're not uh, synchronized? We couldn't do anything about it. So what we've decided to do next was to uh, create a second generation of these uh, cyborg tissues that in addition to recording 
the function of the tissue. We are able to provide electrical stimulation or to release different types of uh, drugs. So if you think about the technology, the uh, patient can sit in his uh, house, if he's not feeling well, and the physician can log on to the computer, can um, uh, decide what's the condition of the heart and decide how he wants to remotely activate this uh, heart. For example, if he senses that there are not enough uh, beats per second, he can provide, just type on the computer and provide electrical stimulation just like a normal pacemaker. If he uh, um, senses that there is not enough oxygen, what he can do, he can type on the computer, release uh, prongiogenic uh, drugs, drugs that uh, uh, um, attract cells to form new blood vessels, and therefore there will be new uh, blood vessels and oxygen uh, will reach uh, the different areas of the heart. If he senses that there is inflammation, he can release anti-inflammatory drugs to avoid this uh, uh, process. And these are not things that I imagined. These are things that we've actually done in this uh, paper. And uh, uh, later on, we were able to create flexible and stretchable electronics and uh, to release different uh, drugs in parallel, up to six uh, different drugs, just by typing on the computer on different time points and different areas within this uh, cardiac patch. However, uh, the electro we, we could also uh, add drugs, reload drugs, just by uh, 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 manipulating the drug and, and circulating it uh, in the bloodstream. It will find its way to the uh, electronics and then be released over and over again. However, the electronics that I've shown so far was uh, electronics uh, that uh, were electronics that uh, were made by uh, lithography, uh, meaning that they're uh, made for the, the, the process is uh, really can fit the electronic industry, but not really fit the body because our organs, for example, the heart is uh, uh, dynamic. It moves all the time. And there's a mismatch in the mechanical properties of the heart and these electronics, which uh, later on can lead to immune response and rejection and uh, et cetera. So what we've decided to do is to use uh, 3D printers to print the electronics already within the patch, but uh, we formulated uh, the, uh, uh, the electrodes to be uh, really soft and to have the same mechanical properties as the cardiac tissue. So. If you look at it, if you, you can appreciate from this movie how soft the tissue is and how soft the electronics is. And from this movie, you can appreciate how flexible this tissue is and how the, uh, uh, the electronics has the same uh, mechanical properties as the tissue. And eventually this can do the same thing. It can record, release drugs and stimulate the engineer the uh, tissue. Sometimes we do not need the electronics to stay uh, there for a long period of time. Sometimes we want it to be eliminated from uh, the body and we, we have two approaches for that. One of the approaches uh, is that uh, the electronics uh, will stay there as, uh, as long as we wish and then we provide an external cue and it will dissolve in the body. The other approach is to design the electronics to be dissolved or degraded after a certain uh, period of time. And in this case, what we've done, we degraded, uh, we, we designed the electronic to be degraded after uh, three weeks in the body. So we created this degradable electronics uh, by printing it. Um, uh, the cardiac cells uh, um, uh, were seated on it. And then we were able to stimulate the tissue and uh, provide recording. And in three weeks, it was dissolved from the body. And the last slide that uh, I'm going to show is uh, uh, our next generation of engineered tissue with uh, or next, our next generation of cyber tissues, uh, actually a bionic heart. As you can see here, we are now printing the entire heart with electronics everywhere. Uh, so the electronics is uh, placed or the electrodes are placed in different strategic areas within this uh, heart. For example, on the septum where the electrical signal transfer and then uh, uh, goes to the different uh, uh, ventricles 
or we have electronics that can release uh, angiogenic factors on the left ventricle, electronics get, that can be used as a pacemaker uh, for the uh, right uh, atrium, etc. So this is the next project. And with that, I will end up and acknowledge my uh, group members, uh, collaborators, on, and of course, my uh, funding, which I couldn't uh, uh, work on this uh, project without it. And uh, thank you very much for listening. Ganz herzlichen Dank. Thank you very much, Taldwir, to New York. We are impressed. Martin Wegener will join me on stage. Now we have the Q&A session, and you are very welcome to ask questions. I think we had two breathtaking insights towards the future with the two presentations. Mr. Wegener. How can you explain where is um, the interface, so to say, between your work and the work we just heard about? Oh, Mr. Dvia cannot hear us. Do you hear us now? Okay. Okay. Okay, you, you asked um, about uh, where we overlap. Well, life science applications, uh, laser printing. I did not refer to what uh, Taldvir was covering, but you can use laser printing as well, which is uh, a competing technology, so to say. Here we wouldn't print the cells, but structures for cells to support them developing in a way you'd like to uh, develop them. I learn a lot from biologists. Uh, sometimes stem cells build small uh, brains, organoids, but they stop growing at a very early stage. And we hope that by adding structured environments with 3D printing, we can convince them to keep growing on their own. So not printing cells as Taldir does, but to help the cells do something they do anyway. Mr. Dvir, what brought up the idea to print a heart? started uh, first uh, not by printing, just by uh, uh, creating uh, cardiac patches because the need, is, the need is obvious to treat uh, uh, patients with uh, heart diseases. And then uh, actually uh, about seven years ago, we bought really, uh, um, um, I don't know, very simple uh, printer because we want to place uh, the blood vessels inside the cardiac patch uh, so it uh, uh, and to place them uh, uh, accurately within these cardiac patches. We couldn't do it uh, in any other way without uh, printers. And uh, then we moved on uh, to more advanced uh, uh, printers. So now we can really print uh, patches and hearts. And, and the, the, there's an obvious need to uh, uh, to print organs because, uh, as you may know, uh, we're in shortage of. Uh, 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 organ donors, and uh, uh, hopefully this approach will allow us in uh, 10 years uh, to replace uh, human donors with uh, uh, printed uh, organs. Well, that, that would be really great. A lot of people are waiting for donor organs, and there's always a shortage of donor organs. Medicine is making progress. Who of you has questions regarding these topics? We have our microphone cube, so just raise your hand and then the cube will be given to you. I don't see any question at the moment. Oh, there is one question. The cube will arrive. Maybe. Well, it's, it's a robust cube. Okay, my question. Fusion technology, we always say 30 years away. How far away do you think um, actually printing any kind of organ are we away from? How many years could you guess or like make a guesstimate? So, so in my opinion, uh, uh, we will start in 10 years to see uh, printed uh, tissues 
not organs, initially tissues, it will start with the simple ones first, uh, uh, skin and, and, and uh, cartilage and, and uh, uh, um, uh, bone. And later on, we will uh, start seeing, uh, I'm sure we'll start seeing uh, hearts and kidneys and uh, retina and other, other tissues. So hopefully in uh, 10, 15 years, we will have uh, printed tissues uh, in hospitals. Fascinating. So there is another question and the cube will come to you. Oh, it's in the back row. Both amazing talks. It was very cool. Um, and I, I have a question to Martin. Uh, do you know already the examples where two photon printing is used for industrial for practical uh, questions and issues, or is it still only scientific curiosity-driven questions? Yeah, indeed, I showed you an example of these 3D printed micro-optics where a master is being printed, and that is then replicated. That is in industrial application at this point, and actually people use nanoscribe instrumentation that I showed. And that's a fairly simple example. I think we will see more in the future, but that's really a point where industrial applications are there already. There are all kinds of other things you can do and people work on, like printing on the micro scale with this laser printing approach, uh, micro robots. And you can fantasize whether they can do something useful in your body, but um, I think that's a long way ahead uh, to make this into an industrial application. Yeah, we have here noch Right, there are two further requests for the floor. I think the gentleman over there was first, so let's try to get this cube to you. Could you let us know again who, who was it? Okay, back row first. to keep the, the order of requests for the floor. Okay, nobody dares to throw the cube. Thank you very much for this very impressive talk. Uh, you already showed us and we know that atrial cells and ventricular cells are different and that septal cells and base cells are different. Uh, does your heart already contain different cells for the different compartments? And uh, does your heart already uh, contain fibroblasts? and uh, functioning fibroblasts? Thank you. Yeah, th that, that's, a, that's a great question. And actually this is, uh, 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 we just last year started a new uh, ELC project uh, where this is exactly what we do. We print the different uh, cell, cardiac cell populations, the uh, atrial cells, the uh, ventricular cells, conduction system uh, cells, blood vessels, the fibroblasts, so we print them in parallel in their right location. Uh, we're still not uh, in a place where I can tell you that we uh, printed uh, uh, a perfect heart, but we can definitely put the different cell types in the right location uh, in, in the structure. Do I need to stand up for the question or? Yeah, bitte, bitte, okay. we can gerne. Um, nowadays, um, many surgeons with, uh, not surgeons, patients with organ diseases, they need organ transplants. And mostly after the organ transplants, they need to take immunosuppressants, which uh, results in many different kinds of um, diseases, like your, total, your whole organ, uh, 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 immune system will be like destroyed in 20 years and will this technique of uh, 3d printing different organs eliminate the use of or immunosuppressants thank you so uh, so yes yeah, so so the fact that we're taking the biomaterials that are used for printing and the cells from the same patient uh, would not require uh, to have immunosuppressor, uh, immunosuppressors uh, later on. This is one of the advantages uh, of, the, uh, of this approach. And again, based off on this approach, we uh, formed the, the uh, company Matricelf, uh, which uh, provides or uh, uh, engineers tissues 
which are completely autologous from personalized biomaterials and patient-specific cells. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in English, um, it seems to me that a lens is a very macroscopic way of dealing with photons, with light. Have you looked at doing things like printing very complicated diffraction gratings or even very, very tiny arrays of things like um, television antennas to harvest and direct photons directly? Yeah, that for me falls into this category of micro-optics. I only showed refractive elements in my talk, but you can make all kinds of diffractive elements. In fact, when I was mentioning applications in mobile phones, these are usually diffractive elements that uh, project onto your image in the infrared something. You can do anything. You can directly print synthetic holograms. In fact, for my birthday, I got one from my group members. You print it right away, um, anything you want. And for that, you need um, really these feature sizes on a scale of sub-100 nanometers and below. Otherwise, you cannot uh, work with light as you would want to. Das klingt wirklich faszinierend. Sie können alles drucken. So that sounds fascinating. You can print anything. What would you like to print that there is not yet available? Well, I heard a lot about structures, passive structures, the lens systems, for instance, but it's not an active structure. So this has been going on for a couple of years. Can we use active structures? Can we use electronics on a finer scale? As Taldvir has shown, 100 scale electronic component transistors, diodes, uh, circular switches. So I'm just wondering, Six months ago, I would have said maybe not, but now it works. In the last six months, a lot of um, progress was made. So we work with chemists, we come up with new ideas. It's just like printing chocolate, as we saw outside in the exhibition area. It looks simple, but then you need the right temperature of your chocolate, the right consistency of your chocolate. And if you have other materials, it is exactly the same. You need the material, you need the chemistry so that everything works with light. But lots of things are happening right now when we talk about new material. Indeed, 3D printing is a big field. Unglaublich. And it is very exciting when we talk about medicine. We have various printers in the exhibition area, different 3D printers. What is the future for you? How would you like to develop it further? We have had 3D printing over the last 40 years. I don't know. There are so many different technologies, competing technologies. They cannot always do the same. They have different scales. They use different materials. And I think it requires a lot of uh, imagination to come up with things that really make sense that you can use. We still work according to old manufacturing techniques. One couldn't do everything. But we should liberate our minds and think in a 3D way. If we think like 3D, lots of things will happen. Do we have further questions concerning this fascinating topic? You ha already have the cube. Two questions. First question is how about the materials with the coefficient, the way I understood it is the carrier medium with a light, and the light leads to a structure that is cured and hardened. But what do you do with the material inside the cube? I didn't tell you, so you were very attentive, very good. Indeed, there is material in the cube. How do you get it out? So you have this um, liquid inside the hard shell. This is a tricky process. In this big cube, there were small cubes. Why do we have the small cubes at the edges of the small cubes? In the development process, we have the monomer technology and we have mechanical tensions. It bursts exactly at this point. The liquid is discharged and you think it's broken. It's not. It is, it is a self-healing process because the polymers are very soft. It's just like glue. And then it is gluing together. I would have never thought that we can reproduce this type of process. It's one of the few examples where we have a tight and hollow structure 3D. It's not that easy. Thank you. I was astonished. Yes, interesting. Second question. You talked about the um, multicolor printing. Indeed. 
as you discussed in your presentation, we talk about the wavelengths, we have material absorption, whether it is liquid or not. Is it possible to use different wavelengths and use different materials in this medium? And then you have the additional material to keep everything up? Yes, very good idea. Um, it's been tricky, and the idea is that you have one color, one material you use, another color and have another material. Sounds very good, but it's very difficult. It hasn't worked out yet. It sounds so easy, but it is not. Any questions? Anybody? Yes, we have a question here in front of the room. And we have our microphone cube. Just throw the microphone cube to the next speaker. Here we go. Floor is yours. Yes. Uh, my question is to Carl. So in terms of the growth of the heart, I was just curious. So if you give the heart to a child, if the child is growing, does the heart, the transplanted heart, the engineered heart, will it grow with the child in terms of age and maturity? So, uh, so heart cells, they're, they're not, uh, th this is how they, they grow in, uh, in their dimension. We will need to, uh, I guess, to print a bigger heart. We're not sure if, uh, um, what will happen to this uh, small heart if we print it in the, for a child uh, five years old, what will happen uh, 10 years later? Uh, because cardiac cells, they're not uh, dividing. Uh, and I'm sure that they will not uh, uh, change their size to be uh, um, uh, two or three folds uh, the, the size, the cells uh, themselves. So we're not sure, perhaps we need to print a bigger heart uh, for, the, for the kids. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your answer. Indeed. I see a further question. It's a problem in society that we could solve as soon as we print organs, Mr. Wegener. Are there any other issues and problems in society that 3D printing can solve? Oh, good question. A little moment. I think it would change our life, if you think about it more, and if you dream that one day you have a little printer and you print whatever you want at your home, so things won't be produced in a factory, they won't be shipped around, stored in a warehouse, and then shipped to the customer. Everything is produced at home. I think you had this picture, you said um, Star Trek in the universal replicator, you simply say, this is what I want, and after a couple of minutes, you'll get it. That was sustainable, too. You save uh, transportation and logistics. Yes, but we've got to be careful because you have to ship material, so the material you use has to be sustainable. I think it's been a long way, so this won't happen in the next 50 years, but I like to be proven wrong in these cases. Your question, please. Professor Wegener, I wanted to ask that, is it also possible to use more photons, for example, four photons absorption to improve direct laser writing? Yeah, actually that's a good point and you have listened. And I talked about taking 1% of 1% to suppress this tail effect. If you do it another time, 1% of 1% of 1%, then you get 10 to the minus six and you suppress much more. And it, it's equally better if you use four photons or five photons. In fact, we have in the lab also used four photon absorption and that is better. It's just uh, technologically uh, even more difficult to get that under control. Yeah. You can do that in the lab but I would be somewhat reluctant to sell that to anybody at this point. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting, thank you. Are there further questions from our audience? So I have a question to um, Tal Tvir. Question for you is, you said like 10 years, so in the next 10 years it might be possible to print a human heart with a 3D printer and implant it for a patient. Now you talked about something totally new, 
concerning the spinal cord. Do you think one day a person in a wheelchair can walk again? How long might that be? So, uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, the company that we formed is already uh, uh, working with the FDA uh, to, uh, uh, to reach clinical trials, hopefully in two and a half years. Um, and uh, so, with these uh, types of tissues, which are not really, they're, they're not printed tissues, they're just engineered tissue in different uh, ways, uh, we can reach the clinic much faster. It's not a, an entire organ, it's just a piece of tissue. And with pieces of tissues, it's uh, less complicated. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for your answer. Many fascinating possibilities that open up. Does 3D printing have disadvantages? One has to mention from an ethical point of view anything one has to discuss it i think no one has a problem that you have a stem cell and then you print your heart print a new heart that is transplanted to myself with my own stem cells nobody worries about that but as taldwir said maybe i don't like my heart i'd like to have a better heart that's more performant and then you print a heart that is more performant and this is where we reach limits. As Taltria said, it's a cyborg heart, so be careful here. One day, as a society, we have to start a discussion. Is that what we want? As a society, it sounds fascinating to think about it, but uh, we should think about it, but it doesn't mean that we'll do it as a society, that we implement these possibilities. Do we have further questions? Or Mr. Tweer, would you like to answer? Floor is yours. So by the way, I think that uh, uh, in, uh, in 10 years, uh, we will all have uh, some kind of electronics within, within our body. Um, I understand, uh, of course, that it's not, uh, it's not uh, really uh, um, ethical to have uh, uh, cyborg tissues or enhanced capabilities of uh, hearts, but uh, you know what we're developing is for uh, medical applications, um, and we'll see how the, the future uh, evolves this uh, this field. Um, this is what I can say. I think yes, I'm fully convinced there will be many things to come up. One question, yes, here is one last question in the room. No? And another person would like to ask, yes. So we still have a question, and then we'll be at the end of our presentation time. One could talk even longer than the two hours. This is such an exciting topic, a compelling topic, and here we go, someone just caught the microphone cube. Oh, thank you for that <laughs> one. <laughs> So thank you to both of the speakers for their excellent talks. I would have two questions, if the time allows. Um, otherwise, I would just ask one question to Mr. Devere. Um, I think you showed mostly extrusion-based bioprinting systems in your talk. Um, do you th think that these bioprinting systems will be also the future for biomedical applications, or do you see any other technique taking the prominence in the next few years with for example, uh, volumetric printing or uh, yeah, tomographic stereolithography being the newest one. So, so I think uh, that uh, eventually there will be a combination of, uh, of the techniques. I think that the extrusion-based uh, printing uh, will be there for sure. And then for the fine features uh, within, perhaps we'll use uh, other, other approaches and other techniques to, uh, to print because the extrusion-based uh, uh, techniques are, um, for now, are limited in their uh, resolution. We cannot reach the resolution, uh, as we mentioned in, in, uh, uh, before. So there will be a combination. Okay, thank you. And for the second question, Mr. Wegener, um, there is this very nice picture there on the on the slide behind you. Can you maybe comment a little on that for a biological uh, application of the two-photon laser lithography? 
Yeah, that's, that's something I briefly mentioned in response to your first question. This is a scaffold structure. Actually, there's no scale bar. It's just like 10 microns or so in extent. And it's made to grow cells in a particular way under controlled conditions. For example, you can do very interesting biological experiments, make a stretch bank out of this and see how the cells react, aiming at better understanding how cells react and perhaps then better controlling or steering cell growth, which eventually would also help you to reconstruct uh, organs. So we have been doing lots of stuff in this direction um, with biologists um, here at KIT, but also at the Universität Heidelberg to use such scaffolds on a smaller scale than what Tal was talking about to, to play with cells, so to speak. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so thank you so much to all of you for your questions, for your participation. Mr. Wegener, Mr. Trier, for these fascinating speeches. Thank you to you, Mr. Talvier, in New York. It's early uh, in New York. This is in uh, Karlsruhe. It's early evening. So give both our speakers a great applause. Thank you to both our great speakers. Thank you, Martin Wegener. And this brings us almost to the end of this event. A very future-oriented topic, 3D printing. Thank you very much to Hector Fellow Academy that you promote these topics, that you organize events like this for the general public, and that you offer a stage. And we are very much looking forward to Dr. Hewlett Elsner, Managing Director, for her final words. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank everybody who made this event happen, to make it this great event. Professor Wegener, Tal Twier, for the very impressive, innovative technology and advances for 3D printing. I was very impressed by seeing the potential of the techniques in this individual adaptation of printed structures when I think about a combination with medical applications or meta material in the focus. In this particular case, as we've seen, it creates an added value for all of us, individual um, hip replacement or glasses, the frames for your glasses or organs that are not from a human donor. But the challenges really are the understanding of highly complex systems. We require know-how of excellent scientists who have interdisciplinary exchanges. And this is exactly what Hector Fellow Academy stands for. I would like to thank Professor Wegener that he was personally so committed for this event that he helped us to create this high level for the concept of this event. Thank you so much. Today's event takes place in cooperation with the Excellence Cluster 3D Meta Made to Order from the KIT Kit and University of Heidelberg. And on behalf of the management of University of Heidelberg, thank you, Professor Wanner, for your support. And also, Thank you to all our young scientists who helped us in the lobby for the 3D printers and the cluster. Hector Fellow Academy has this symposium for future-oriented science, and we would like to discuss it. In HFA, more Hector Fellow Academy, we have more than 60 science scientists from the Mint Medical Psychology and Natural Sciences. The public symposium takes place every year at the sites where our Hector Fellows work. So I would like to invite you for next year in Berlin. Professor Peter Hegemann will be the host of next year's symposium. And it'll be light in biology, photosynthesis, visual processes, and neural applications will be our next event in Berlin. At the end of this presentation, I would like to thank Hector Foundation, Hans-Werner, Elisabeth Hector, and also 
the members of the board who are here, Ute Gleichen Schauer. Without your financial support, the Symposium and Hector Fellow Academy wouldn't be possible. Thank you so much. And last but not least, thank you, dear guests, for being so interested, for joining us tonight, and for being here live, online, or here in Karlsruhe. So I would like to wish you a very nice evening and say goodbye to those who are online. Those who are here in Konzerthaus Karlsruhe are coolly invited to continue the discussion. And as you see, we had all the questions. You see how interested everybody was. And we have prepared some drinks. So I'm looking forward to the exchange of you with you. Have a safe trip home. Thank you for your support. And I'm looking forward to next time. See you then. <laughs>